We have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. We have come into this house to magnify the Lord. Good morning, church family. The day has finally come when the Figueroa Church of Christ will reopen for morning worship. We will contact members soon to gauge their desire for worship attendance that will begin May 2nd. The reopening team has worked behind the scenes to prepare for this day. Moving forward, this video can be seen at figueroacoc.com. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So forget about yourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Him. Oh, worship Him. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Cause we have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. See, we have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. Well, we have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. Oh, oh worship Him. to have you with us as you do each week you are welcome and we appreciate you uh, joining us this morning this is the day that the lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it it's just good to be in the house of the lord good to see orlando mary back in church i haven't seen that boy in church for a year and so i know he will be consecrating and confessing and calling on the name of the Lord Jesus and looks like you do Hail Marys will allow a couple of just a couple of those in, in the Lord's house. Good to see you this morning. And then Brother Taiska, thank you for stepping in. Uh, you are such a blessing. I know this is a challenging week for you. Our heart goes out to you and your family. We will do all we can to facilitate uh, your mom's homegoing services in a way that would be uh, beneficial to the family and that will bring God glory. And then, of course, uh, our, our worship team. Uh, under the leadership of, I mean, uh, Brother Taishka, we're happy to have Paula. She's been consistent. Uh, Sister Hawkins is not with us this morning. Uh, the, time, the time that we did have off, we were able to have someone to watch a mom, but she is watching via live stream. And then Mr. Mr. Mar uh, Reliable uh, here in, in, in the flesh. And that's my good friend, uh, Brother Derek Pierre. And we appreciate him as well. If you have your Bibles, it's good to have a full audience this morning. I've been waiting on uh, a return to the service. And we have just two lovely sisters in person <laughs> of Sister G, Greta King, uh, Along with Kim, Kim uh, Miller, we appreciate you guys being with us. And then, of course, uh, our good deacon, uh, Brother Payne and, and Sister, I mean, Brother Pickens and Sister Pickens are with us this morning. We're happy to have you as well. Someone is saying, why are they here? Well, they're part of the reopening team, and we have a meeting 
following my sermon, and I'm grateful to the person who broke the clock this morning. And so right now it is a quarter to nine, and uh, it's been there for the last hour, and that's perfectly fine with me. Uh, we're going to be meeting immediately after service to finalize some things for our reopening on next Lord's Day morning. If you have your Bibles, let's go, please, to John, the fourth chapter. I want to thank uh, Ken Klein for opening this up this morning, along with Ahmad Mallet and the responsive reading and prayer, and then Benjamin uh, with the reading of the scripture and the, inv uh, the invocation prayer. We are appreciative to all of our brothers who participate week after week uh, in our services. John chapter 4 will be our place to study verses 20 through 26. Today's sermon uh, is uh, in connection with last week's sermon uh, as we made our way up to the mountain of the Lord, to the top of the mountain, to the house of the God of Jacob for worship. We're going to continue that, that trajectory as we prepare all of us to uh, reconvene together in corporate worship here on next Lord's Day morning. John chapter 4, uh, Brother Mary, verses 20 through 26. Our text finds its meaning in the context of a narrative where Jesus encounters a woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. This story is unique in that in this encounter, Jesus addresses several long-standing traditions among the Jews of the first century that involve race, gender, class, and religion slash worship. It is packed with spiritual insight and doctrine on socioeconomic, cultural, and theological beliefs relative to life and godliness. We're reminded of this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Emphasis on knowledge. That's important when it comes to worship, which is the case in this particular text. This knowledge, it is this acquisition of knowledge about worship that concerns us this morning and brings us to our text as we prepare to reopen our facility on next Lord's Day, May 2nd. And if you will, go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, for worship. It is in this text we find a woman of Samaria. Many of you are familiar with this story. She now pivots from private and personal and a very sensitive subject about her own life. She moves away and focuses in on the place of worship, which is equally as important as the perusal of our own individual life. I don't want to hang out there too long, but you cannot separate the person from worship because it, it is the person that worships. And so Jesus understands what he's dealing with here. Uh, his encounter with this woman is no accident. His prophetic ministry involved going to Samaria going to the Decapolis, to those areas where non-Orthodox non Jews live in order that they might uh, encounter the Messiah who is called Christ. In this particular text, 10 times the term worship is referenced. And it is here defined as the act of showing reverence towards God. It is also defined as giving homage to a deity. But in this particular case, the concept of worship is born out of an idea, out of Judaism, where uh, uh, worship was monotheistic, one, one God. And this is the case because the challenge behind worship here 
is, a, is, a, uh, is something that rests in the context of place and not person. And I want, you to, I want you to hold on to that idea. Because when we return to this facility, we're not returning for the place. We're returning for the person. Uh, as a matter of fact, in worship, both the subject and the object is always God. Literally, we are onlookers and participants in that which already exists, and that is the area of the divine and the holy and the spiritual, who is our God. So the word worship here has more to do with our approach to God and our understanding of who he is. That's why knowledge is key, because quite often you can worship God out of ignorance, and that is the case for most of us until we come to know better. Ignorance does not suggest that you do not know, but it may suggest that you do not have the correct knowledge about what you are doing. Because this woman will remind Jesus that our people say that we worship in these mountains. Now, historically, she's talking about two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Mount Gerizim, they would pronounce the blessings. But on Mount Ebal, Ebal, they would pronounce the curses. This is found in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. It was their way of just opposing the good against the, the, the evil or the bad, so to speak. And then Jesus reminds her uh, as a result of her question. Because she said to him, you say this place, but our fathers, and she's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob under the uh, patriarchal dispensation and later on under the Mosaic dispensation, places of worship were significant. But now under the Christian dispensation, places are no longer the object nor the subject. God remains to be both the subject and the object of worship. Are y'all with me? And so Jesus says something to her that's very interesting. There are several things I want to highlight about this concept of worship. Some scholars refer to worship as an example of a dog licking his master's hand. Or should I say a kiss that's given of endearment by royal people. It's not uncustomary for certain cultures to kiss people of influence on either side of their cheek. But the word here has more to do with our, our obedience to the God of heaven, our homage, words that we don't use anymore. We use the word reverence. But I think in some cases, it needs to be attached to the term to adore, to have a sense of adoration for. That's vitally important, because what good is it coming to a facility absent a knowledge of who you're worshiping. When that happens, when that happens, we have a tendency to relegate worship to human movement, to my feelings and my thoughts. I want, to us, I want us literally to have our minds elevated, to understand worship doesn't start with you. It always starts with God. And he's the facilitator of what you do and what you don't do and how you see him and how you should not see him. And that's why I want to lay out on the front that worship must and has to be spiritual. I think once you walk away from this text, you would have to conclude that worship is spiritual. That is, it's divine. It is godly. Where are you getting this from? Notice verse 24. Jesus tells this woman in the course of this discussion that God is spirit. Now notice, it doesn't say God is a spirit. Some versions have that. And that's, uh, I think that's a mistake. Because uh, outside of God, there is no other God. So God is not a spirit. God is, in the Greek text, is spirit all by himself. And Jesus concludes that if he is spirit, and he is, that those who revere him, those who adore him, those who have reverence towards him must worship him, get this now, in spirit and truth. 
Now there's an interesting note here about this spirit and about this truth. Notice that it's not a capital S. Uh, and for a long time I wondered why. Because it is understood that the believer is already spiritual. In a spiritual relationship. So the word here is the same word we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. The Greek word is pneuma, has to do with breath, but it's talking about one's mental disposition. In other words, you have to be sober in worship. Say amen. amen. Brethren, you have to be cognitively present in worship. In other words, you cannot have divided loyalty in worship. If God is the center of worship, then he gets all of the attention. Are you with me? So the spirit here has to do with one's mental disposition. And then the word truth comes from a word that literally references the truth of God. So in a nutshell, worship is spiritual. And it must be carried out with the right attitude based upon the word of God. John chapter 17 and verse 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. The sanctifying process, the process of consecration involves having the word of God to do the cleansing of our souls and of our hearts and correcting those things that are out of sync and bringing us into direct consultation with God himself. Worship is serious business. That's why when last week we talked about consecration. We've talked about confessing our sins. Y'all remember that? Consecration. Not concentration. Consecration. You can't consecrate. You can't concentrate until after you consecrate. Say amen. Say amen. I know it's a little tricky on the words there, but you look those up there, Orlando, it'll come to you. But the point of the matter is, you've got to have your mind right. That's why we, 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 we usher people into worship with certain songs. We have come into this place. Isn't that beautiful? You know, uh, we're standing on holy ground. You know, these help get our minds right. Uh, because between the time you leave uh, your car in the parking lot uh, and get into this facility, you can encounter a whole lot of stuff. Because everybody in the parking lot ain't in, well, I'm just saying. And then even people in the facility doesn't mean necessarily they're in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when worship is relegated to feelings, and thoughts and moods and temperaments, we're going to have a problem. And that's usually the case. And somewhere along the line, we've got to reel ourselves back in and understand this is not playtime. This is serious time. But we have allowed the evil one to infiltrate our minds that we've dumbed down worship to a human activity. That's why we are clock-eyed. Say amen when you can. We don't have time for God. And we want to get out in a hurry and get on back to our corner world and have him rubber stamp our worship. And we love to quote this passage at the end of service. We pray that we have worship in spirit and in truth. That don't make it true. Because worship is not defined by what you say, but by what you do in relationship to the God of heaven. Are we making sense? I'm just... I'm going to get to the sermon. I got another two or three hours. The clock is still broke, but we're going to get down here. I just want to lay the foundation. And so when we talk about worship, we're talking about those individuals, get this now, who are born again by the Holy Spirit. And those who are born again by the Holy Spirit, get this now, are privileged to worship God. I want to drop by for a moment and tell you that worship is not your right. This, ain't, this, this is not a matter of constitution or human rights. We are privileged to worship God. And it is only the result of his grace that allows us to do that. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, for reference, Paul would say, not by works of righteousness. In other words, Orlando, there is nothing you and I can do to merit God's attention in worship service. You can't put on the right suit. 
You cannot have the right religious posture. You cannot have adequate knowledge of everything in the Bible. That doesn't please God. What pleases God is a broken and contrite spirit that walks in under humility and understands that we're in the presence of a holy God. Absent of that, then we'll treat him like we do any other thing. And it's not to be demeaned or brought low because of our lack of understanding. We have to elevate our thinking about who this God is. Because whether you quote this passage or not, it's irrelevant. The question is, what's in your heart? And so the believer, the believer has to be born again. And notice what Paul would say. We have, there's nothing we've done, no works of righteousness we have done. But get this, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Worship is spiritual. And as a result, we must be born again of the Spirit to entertain that which is spiritual. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. A carnal-minded man cannot comprehend spiritual things. That's why he's in a hurry to get out of here. He don't have the Spirit of God. I don't mean no harm. I'm not saying you guys, but he don't have the Spirit of God in him. Because the Spirit is wooed by the Spirit to hang out with the spiritual. Say amen. What, what woos you to get up out of worship and go handle your business? What spirit is that? Would God's spirit ever prompt you to get up out of his worship service and go handle your carnal business? Not that your business is not important, but when your business is more important than his business, we got a problem with your business. That, uh, that makes sense? So true worshipers are not those who are simply quoting scripture, but have an understanding of what it really means to be in a covenant relationship with him. We are born again by the Spirit. John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You remember the discussion God had, Jesus had rather, with Nicodemus, who came at nighttime. He knew about Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no man can do the miracles that you do without God. Jesus moves immediately past all the fluff and says, Nicodemus, except a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus, a learned religious man, yet human, could not comprehend that. I understand that. You know, by mere virtue that you've been baptized should never presuppose or assume that you have understanding. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a teacher of one of the most strict religions of the Jewish sect. But he couldn't, he couldn't understand that. So he asked the question, and quite honestly, I would be ashamed to ask the question, but when you don't know, you just don't know. And you have to ask a question. That's why I learned somewhere along the line that there are no wrong questions. There are no stupid questions necessarily, but there are questions that come from the heart when you don't understand. Why would a grown man ask another grown man, how can a man be born again when he is old? Go figure that out. You would think common sense. Unless Nicodemus was trying to be funny, and I don't think he was. And I can't say that he wasn't. Because most Pharisees thought that they knew more than the Messiah himself. So he asks, and then Jesus tells him, except a man is born of the water and the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about spiritual regeneration, that which we just read in Titus chapter 3, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit himself that bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans chapter 8, 15 and verse 16. Therefore, we worship. We worship in the Spirit. And no wonder Paul would, would mirror exactly what he says to Titus in chapter 3, verse 5, and Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when he says, I beseech you. Some other version says, I beg you. That word means to beg. I implore you, therefore, and get this now, brethren, by the mercies of God. Isn't that interesting? That's the same thing that is said in Titus chapter 3. And I had to ask myself, what does mercy have to do with worship? Until I went back to the Old Testament. And I began to look at the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was placed in the most holy place. 
There was the outer, there was the inner court, and then there was the holies of holies. In the holies of holies, they were separated by a veil, but behind the veil was the ark of the covenant. And on top of the covenant, get this now, is a mercy seat. And guess who sits there? God sits there. The priests could not sit there with him. They were not worthy, and he picked them because they were humans. The only other person after the resurrection I know, and even before they sat down with him, was Jesus Christ. And so Paul, in Titus 3, get this now, and in Romans 12, is begging us, watch this, not by human will, not by human initiative, not by human righteousness, but he's begging us by the mercies of God. Get this now, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I don't have time to hang out there too long. We worship a God who is outside of us, who invites us in to his space by his mercy. Listen now, it makes sense to me because on a good day, I'm never clean enough to come into his presence. Somebody ought to say amen. And neither are you. You can confess all day long and you're still not worthy, but by his mercy, he lets me in. Some stuff ought to make you just run and shout. I know you ain't what you should be, but I'm going to give you my mercy. And my mercy rises above, get this now, any adjudication by Satan himself. And that's why the accuser of the brethren cannot bring one railing accusation against God's people. But that's good news. And if he did, if Satan would stand before God and indict me, he would be right about me. But guess what's my saving grace? His mercy! And so he allows me to come in. And then I have the, I, the, the audacity, the, as the old men, old folk used to say, the old preachers, the unmitigated God to come into the house of God wondering when we're going to get out of here <laughs> and how long you're going to be and whether or not you got anything. Listen, you come to this house expecting to hear from God. The problem is with this house, you haven't been doing it at your house. I'll, I'll look off. You haven't been doing that at your house. And so you treat this house just like your house. You haven't been worshiping God there. And then when you come here, you want to put some, some, some tradition on it. Amen. This, this, it's not about you. We are here by his mercy. You know what woke you up this morning? His mercy. Death was standing by your bed. God threw some mercy on death and he moved on by. And God touched you. Woke you up this morning. That's why you ought to wake up and praise him. Psalms division 118 in verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And you can't rejoice and be mad in it because rejoicing don't hang out with madness. Help me somebody. It only hangs out with gladness. What are you glad about? Everything God has done for me. Roof over my head. God did that. Shoes on my feet. God did that. Two dollars in my pocket, God did that. Grits in the pantry, God did that. Give God praise. And we'll show up here next Sunday wondering who's that in my seat over there. And I plan to buy and that beat me. And if I catch him, I'm going to buy him right on the spot. Yeah, you had a whole year to, to get that stuff straight. He put you in a pandemic and shut you down so you can give him some attention so you know how to return to his house. I don't make no pause in what I'm preaching. It's straight out the Bible. The reality is some of us are still ignorant. And some have become this straight out arrogant. Believing that you can run up into the house of prayer and do anything you want. I drop by to tell you that just ain't so. Say amen. Say all that God won't fix when you get out of control. Popo will. And I will call him. Say amen. How did that get in there? I don't know but you needed to hear it. Because some of us believe that we are running things and we're not. So we have these attitudes. 
There's no gratitude. There's no gratefulness. There is no honor. And then we show up broke and, and won't give God a dollar. Tell my praise the Lord. Say amen. Don't, don't, don't say amen. Clock ain't still broke. I still got another hour and a half to go, but I want you to get this. And I'm hoping the audience is listening, and I'm hoping Figueroa is listening. We're not coming back to business as usual next Sunday. No, 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 no. If that's the case, I'll pull out one of them old sermons you didn't hear. And you'll be meeting, you'll be meeting while in worship to figure out what's wrong with the preacher. No, it can't be business as usual. God's brought us out of pandemic. We're still here, but by his grace. He needs to be celebrated. And that's why my sermon next week is entitled, Say Amen. Say Amen, Psalms 122. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house. We're going to celebrate next Lord's Day morning if the Lord say the same. But until then, we got to work with this text. Y'all got a little more time? Now get this now. Get this now. Paul says, I beseech, I'm begging you by the mercies of God. Get this, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, don't come in here dead and ready to go to sleep next Lord's Day. That's the old you. That's what you used to do. Crack open your peanuts in the back, say amen. Pass out candy, write checks, do everything but give God. Your undivided attention. Then you want a blessing on the way out. Something wrong with that picture. Has more to do with what the Samaritan woman was going through. She had a knowledge of God, but it was misinformation based on traditions and teachings of men and doctrines of demons. But now Jesus says to them, woman, an hour is coming when neither in these mountains nor get this now in Jerusalem. Now that's interesting because Jerusalem was the place of worship. And in this text he says, y'all don't know what y'all worship, but we know what we worship. Why? Because salvation is of the Jews and Jesus is right. Even Judaism had its place. But Judaism wasn't God's plan for all mankind. That's why he gave us the Messiah. And that's why that woman said to Jesus, we know all of that, but when Messiah come, the one who is called Christ, he's going to set things straight. And there are very few cases in the New Testament when Jesus reveals his identity. And this is one of them. Matter of fact, this is the first one. Jesus said to this woman, the one you are speaking to, I am he. I am Messiah. You know what he's saying? So what I'm telling you is the truth. You can dismiss what the father said. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, they served their, they served their time. Now the Messiah is speaking. And then he says, you present your body as a living sacrifice. That's why, that's why we need to prepare our mind, bodies, and spirits for worship. I get up, I've gotten up for a lot of things in my life. And I got up for a lot of wrong reasons. Amen, somebody. I'm going to hang out there, but when it comes to the kingdom of God, the energy I had for that stuff, I ought to have it for my God. I need to get my mind right, my spirit right, and my soul right. Because I'm headed to the place of God. Say amen when you can. Sister Hawkins don't have to remind me what day it is. I don't even need a clock anymore. I know when the Lord's day is coming. The Hebrew writer says so much more as you see the day approaching. Two thoughts. The day of worship and the day of judgment. You need to get ready for both of those. And the point is too many of us have to be prompted to do God's work. And I say to you the spirit of God is not in you. Another spirit. If after a while you have to be reminded what the Spirit woos you to do, something wrong with you. When God made fish, he never once told after he made the fish, swim. You never see a fish checking in, asking God what we're going to do down here in this water. We're going to do by nature what I put in you to do. That's why Peter says in 2 Peter 1, you have been given a divine nature. And that nature is pulled along by the Spirit. That Spirit longs for spirituality and not carnality. Can somebody help me right along in here? I know about the carnal man. He wants what he wants, when he wants. And he even wants his God to do his bidding. There's a wrong, something wrong with that picture. 
Too often we relegate men who are not spiritual to spiritual things, and that's disheartening. Never turn over spiritual stuff to unspiritual fellas and expect to have spirituality. You're going to get what you've been getting, carnality. So the presentation of self is important. I think on the first day of the week, you need to be alert, attentive, and awake. Say amen. And maybe you should awake first, then be alert that you are awake, and then you can have some attention. Why are you standing in the presence of a holy God? I thought about that. I rode in this morning listening to a beautiful song that I love by one of our sisters who now sings it. Uh, it was, uh, I can only imagine. And I thought about that this morning, what it would be like to stand in his presence. And you know the lyrics of the song. Will I be able to stand at all or to my knees fall? And then the God know me, can I really look up at him in honesty and purity? And then what came to mind was that fellow in Luke chapter 12. When the two went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a sinner, the sinner recognized. He recognized that God was holy and that he was unholy. I think about that a lot. Even in my best efforts to walk right, I'm not worthy. But his mercy invites me in. This is amazing. Jacked up, messed up, he lets you come in. And then you sit down and go to sleep on it. Something wrong with that picture. And you can sing heaven's on the other side if you want. But there's another place on the opposite side of heaven. I haven't heard too many songs referencing that place. The presentation of yourself is important. Look at the text. Holy. Holy. That's consecration, people. You know, on a good day, after you and I have confessed all of our sins, past, present, and future, you're still not worthy. But because of his spirit, his grace, and his mercy, he allows us to come in and sit down with him around the table. I thought about that. You know, when he picked those 12 boys, he knew what he was picking. He didn't knock who they were. He accepted who they were, but he knew he was the change agent. So I only told those boys, Derek, just follow me. And if you follow me, when I get through with you, you'll be fishing for men. And then he sat down with them the night before betrayal. Had the last supper. We call it communion, but it was a Passover supper. And he says, one of you will betray me. In that same text, he says, I've chosen 12 of you, but one of you is a devil. And they all began to look at each other. Who is it? And Jesus says, the one who dips his hand in the dish with me. And at that time, it was Judas. And all Jesus says, well, whatever you do, do quickly. But he knew. He knew that James and John were hot-headed. He knew that Peter packed a pistol, I mean a knife. He knew about Bartholomew, Barnabas. He knew the hard shells. That's why he hung out. He had to call the, the sons of thunder and Peter. Y'all come with me. He didn't have to do that with Barnabas. You know, Barnabas had a spirit like Derek. Derek is just nice, even kill guy. But cats like Joe and, 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 and Orlando and Hawk, we, we got to follow close by Jesus. And even then, we got beside ourselves. Mark 9, Matthew 17, when they went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter got beside himself. James and John were there along with Peter, the sons of thunder. And there Jesus transfigured himself, and there he appeared with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus himself. Peter said, Lord, good for us to be here. I hope somebody says that next, song, next, next Sunday. Lord, it's good for us to be here. We're in your glory, in your presence. The Bible says while Peter was running his mouth, and he had some good ideas, Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles, three, three booths, one for you, of course, because you're the Lord, one for Elijah, because he's the great prophet, and then one for Moses, because he's the lawgiver. The Bible says while he yet spake, God spoke, and you didn't hear from Peter anymore. What's the point? God's holiness transcends our carnality. 
and that ought to cripple our minds into submission. Listen, I don't know about you, but handling this book divine, ah, the more I learned about this God, I'm saying, God, really? You, you, you want me? You know me? I'm just about as bad as that almond, that almond joy song. You know, you know the one, Orlando, sometimes I feel like a nut. And sometimes you can Google it later, but it is actually a song. It was something about, I'm enjoying. But some of us feel like that. There are days when you, you and God are walking hand in hand in the garden of your imagination. And five minutes later, you got your hand in the hand. Come on now. And then turn right around and he bids you come to him and meet him at the table every last day. That's humiliating. That's how I mean, that ought to correct some stuff, people, especially after 80 years. We ought to know better. We ought to be better. Not bitter, but better. I haven't gotten to my sermon yet. Still got another hour. This is wonderful. This is a great day. And then look at the last. I'm still in Romans 12. Look at the end of verse 2. Holy and acceptable to God. And look at this phrase. Which is your reasonable service? One version says worship. And the reason being is because the Greek word here is not the same word for servant, doulos, but it's latreia. Latreia. And that means to worship. It's the kind of service you offer God. And when you worship God, you serve. Don't get it twisted. Worship is just not an event. It's not an activity. It's an event. You worship God when you serve. Outside of the facility. You're acknowledging God. Isn't that wonderful? Worship is first and foremost spiritual. Guided by the Spirit, Galatians 6, 18. It's a forethought, not an afterthought. I said it's a forethought, not an afterthought. You don't show up and say, oh yeah, we in worship. <laughs> you leave home worshipful in your spirit, in your mind. Cannot wait to congregate with others. That lets me know that not only is worship spiritual and not a, not an afterthought, it is private. Get this now. It is personal and then it is public. Think about that. If you're only worshiping once a week, you mean the Holy Spirit only bids you to God once a week? What are you doing in your personal time and in your private time? See, I had to learn that because I was a Sunday go church person too. Till I learned that I am the church and you can't go to yourself. But at least you could begin to understand that first of all, worship, are you getting this? It's private. It's personal. And then it's public. And whatever you've been doing in private and personally, that's what you're going to do public. See, you can't stay up and read the word. Amen and fall asleep here. Because the same thing you're reading there will keep you woke here. Come on now. But you can stay awake at the, at the ball game. Matter of fact, matter of fact, you can, you, matter of fact, if it's, if, if, it, if it's something you've been waiting to do, you will shut your system off. And will have forgotten that you hadn't gone to the bathroom. But when you come to the house of God, for some strange reason, all of your physical abnormalities manifest themselves. And you got a train running up and it just can't stay still. Say amen somebody. I don't mean no harm here. But it's time that we expect more from our individual selves. And don't start looking at people talking about what they should do. I'm talking to you. And I'm talking to me. Worship is serious. So much so that Jesus says true worshipers. That's interesting. This is the only time you will see the phrase true worshiper. And the only person that uses it is Jesus Christ. Because he assesses the heart and the mind. True worshipers. Look at this. Look at the language. Verse 23. Will worship. There are no presuppositions and options. Do you not know for those who have been born of the Spirit, worship is not an option? Worship is tantamount to you breathing air right now. 
Why in the world do we quote Acts 17? In him we live. We love to say that. In him we live and move and have our very existence. Well, you ought to act like it. You ought to move around like God is living in there. That makes sense. And so oftentimes we, we, we put on religious shows. And I've been guilty of it. All of us are guilty of it. We care more about the externals than we do about the internals. We spend more time figuring out what we're going to wear and whether we're matching than figuring out what's in them scriptures. Say amen. You need not come to Bible class sharp as you are and can't find John in the Bible. Say amen, somebody. You getting my point? I'm not advocating. Don't look good. No, look good. Take a shower. Get yourself right. Of course, you're going into the presence of God. But what's more important is not the external, but the internal. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. True worshipers will worship the Father and notice the object of worship. Notice the subject of worship. The subject of worship, the Father. The object of worship, the Father. The mode of worship, spirit, right attitude. And truth, the word of God. Why? For the Father is seeking. Same Greek word in Luke 9.23. Luke 19.10, it means to pursue with the intention of finding. God is looking for people with the right attitude, the right mental disposition based on my truth to worship me. That's what verse 23 is about. And Jesus says it, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. True worship is in the spirit and truth of God's word. Now, my little sermon, and I'll let you go. Therefore, true worshipers, number one, they know God. Number two, they are known by God. And number three, this is important, they acknowledge God. There's no way in the world you can come into worship and not acknowledge God. And hear me now, this foolishness about you better be glad I'm here, you better watch yourself with that thinking and even speaking. I wouldn't even tell anybody that because the same God you're saying that to could snatch what breath you have out of you and then you got to deal with him. So you be careful how you come back here assuming it's going to be the way it used to be. If it is, we're in trouble because we know who we're going to get from you. That pandemic should have broke us, broke us all down. We should be humbled and humiliated that God sustained us in the midst of it. Didn't take our lives. So come on now. A lot of people are suffering even today and we're still in the pandemic. But yet God, God has blessed you. God has blessed me. I thank him. I'm so unworthy. But every day, every Sunday for the last year, he let me come. I decided if I'm going to show up, I'm going to give him a best. I know I'm not his best. But I'm going to try to give him the best I bring to the table. So I'm not going to cut God short and I'm not going to cut my sermon short. So you can shortly get out of here. I'm not doing that. Either you come here for the right reason or you come here for the wrong reason. And God would judge that. I'm responsible to the God of heaven. And I have a fiduciary responsibility to you. To feed you the manna that comes from God himself. So everyone who worships God must know God. Verse 22, Jesus reminds us that worship is about seeking what the Father wants. And this is interesting. I hadn't seen this at first. For the Father is seeking. Why pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but don't apply it to worship? What is God's will in worship? That you worship, first of all, privately that you worship personally so that when you come publicly you are teaching others by your worship well, I'm going to hang out there for a moment can you imagine how much false doctrine you've taught in this building through your worship by saying it's not important you don't have to listen to him if you never like me you better listen to this word Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48 he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. Watch this now. The words that I have spoken unto him will judge him in the last day. You may not like me, but learn to love God. 
You got to get to know this God. And you know too many passages. Psalms 46, 10a, be still and know what in the world do you think God did through this pandemic? He shut it down so you and he can spend some time together. And you're too blind to see it. Brother Wilford Moore, bless his heart, he's having some serious health challenges. But he dropped a theological bomb on my class one Sunday morning. He said the pandemic was a blessing. Everybody got quiet, even me. Then I started to process. What do you mean? Do you not know God can take whatever he creates to either save you or kill you? Take water. The deluge under the patriarchal dispensation was the result of sin. So he used water. Turn around 2,000 plus years later. Took the same water and used it as a means of cleansing us of our sins. Save it. The same water you can drink that gives you life. Sister Hawkins calls water the elixir of life. Because now, I won't leave, I'm going to leave that alone. Because I know some other elixirs. Say <laughs> Amen. Because she, she, knows, she knows me. But yeah, I pray for the preacher. You know he's working on it and stuff like that. But here's my point. The word of God, the word of God has power in it. Be still and know that I am God. It had been a good time to do that in the pandemic. That regardless of what goes down, whether you live or die, I am still God. Not only that, I'm the God of the dead. I can raise folk from the dead. But too often when you are distant from God, you can't see what God is doing. We wanted the pandemic to be over so that we can get back to business. Be your business and my business, the money-making business. And some of us have missed the golden opportunity to get to know about this God. We must come to know God. That is, according to Psalms 139, there are some things we know about God. And I'm going to bring it to a close. But very few of us know of God. What do we know about God? Psalms 139, we know that he's omniscient. We know that he's omnipresent. We know that he's omnipotent. You know about God. We know that he's self-existent, self-sustaining, and self-sufficient. But that's what you know about God. But what do you know of him in terms of his character, his person, and his heart? This is where Exodus 34, 6 is important. When Moses wanted to know this God that had called him up to the mountain and sent him out to the wilderness, he needed a close encounter with the divine. He needed reassuring. He was busy with the task, but he needed a little more. So he wanted to see God, and God reminded him, no man can see me and live. But because you're my friend, and I talk to you face to face to tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut out a hue in the mountain. I'm going to cut out a cliff in the mountain. I'm going to set you there, Moses, and then I'm going to pass by. I'm going to hide myself from you. Bless your eyes because you can't handle who I am. I thought about that. And so the Bible says, Jehovah said to Moses, the Lord passed before Moses. And look what the Lord said. This is what he said when he passed by. The Lord the Lord God. Get this now. Merciful. There it is again. Gracious. Long-suffering. Abounding in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. And by no means clearing the guilty. This is what it is to know of God. And that's why Orlando you merit his mercy, and so do I. And that man on the corner, and that woman down there. So watch yourself. Watch yourself when you drive by the homeless. Talk about how dirty, how dirty looking, and how smelly they are. Say amen. You can have a suit on and smell just as bad. Act just as bad. You see, the closer you get to God, the first thing he starts working on is not your neighbor. He starts working on your head. Because some of us have been shrouded by 
false notions of religiosity. We're so blind we can't even see God anymore. That's why these scriptures are so powerful. God passed by Moses and it was life changing. He had gone up without the veil but now he comes down veiled. You know why he's veiled? He's been in the presence of God. You can always tell when people have been in the presence of God if you see tremendous change in a person's life. God did that. You don't go to Toastmasters and, kill, uh, uh, and Garnegie speech class to get that. That's divine work. This God, this God, we must come to know. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul says, I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Get to know this God that we're talking about. And not only must you know this God, you must be known by this God. I'll give you one passage. John 10 verse 14, interesting text. Jesus declared, I am the good shepherd. Get this now. I know my sheep and am known by my own. It's one thing to claim that you know him. The question is, does he know you? Isaiah 1.3, the ox knows his owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know me. Our people do not understand. And then I heard Jesus say in Matthew 7.22, many will come to me in that day. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works in your name? And I would declare to them, I never knew you. One thing you can't do in worship is bring your religious calendar of things you've done. God already knows. Matter of fact, he knows more about what you have not done than that which you claim you have done. You can't play God, you can play us. But you can't play God. He can say, I never, what do you mean you never, I've been at that church all my life. My grandfather, people love it, they love to pull out that heritage card on me. I mean on you. Well, so and so, laid the first brick. Well, good, 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 good. I never knew you. Then I thought about myself. Lord, I've been preaching all of this time. Say, say amen, amen. And I, 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 me, 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 I never knew you. And I thought about this. Why have you been preaching, Vincent? Is it more about public praise? than private piety? Is it more about a name? Is it more about financial gain? Why are you doing what you're doing? I already know, Vincent, but do you know? I never knew you. Lord, I've traveled out of the country for you. Get up every morning, I, I do. I don't even know you. And what's sad about this passage is the reality that he says, I never knew you. Think about it. But I got baptized. You're not listening, Vincent. I never, even in your baptism, it was more about you and less about me. Now on your religious journey, you've hid behind the cloak of clergy. But it's not, hasn't been about me. People, if you don't have that kind of talk with yourself, you need help. Every human being got to deal. Joe, you got to deal with that. That beautiful voice, God gave you that. That's not to anybody's glory, not even your own son. It's for his glory. But I know your heart. Doc, I've seen you sing the way you I've never not seen you sing, except when you weren't here. And even when you were not here, we hurt you. Your heart's in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, listen, I'm about as unperfect as you are. So I'm not going to show up. And not show out for God and then act a fool any place else. The energy I'm going to use is for God's glory. And at the end of the day, my destiny is in his hands. If he bids me into the temple or he makes other decisions, whatever his judgments are, they are right. And I cannot help but accept them. So check yourself on that. Mark 12, 29, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I'm talking about acknowledging God. Jesus taught that. We're talking about doctrine now. Look what Jesus taught. When they came, that young lawyer came to him in Mark 12, verse 28, with a question, good master, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus remembered 
Deuteronomy chapter 6 and quoted the Hebrew Shema. Hear, O Israel! The word hear there literally means to listen with discernment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord, our God is one. That's theology. We are a monotheistic religion. You need to remember that, which means you need to go get rid of some of your gods. That's polytheism. If God is not your God, you are polytheistic with a suit on. I'm not talking about you, but you get my point. Amen. We got some other gods. Here on Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. And how should we respond to him? One thing, out of love. And love him with, with, with all of you, not just some of you. All your mind. All your strength. All your body and all your spirit, all your soul. Love God. Learn to love him. And all that stuff you're chasing, he'll give you all of that. But some of us have traded in the cheese for God's glory. And you wonder why we complain. The humanity in which we find ourselves is torn and tattered. We are in a bad way. Now, I'm not going to dress it up. I know people want to hear good, good, you know, positive words. Well, listen, there's time for positive words and there's time for positive truth. The truth of the matter, you want to determine how humanity is? Look how it treats itself. And who is your assessment now? And if they treat him like that, if they treat us like that, how do you think they feel about God? Because if they knew who he was, like Jesus, they could deal with the woman's issues of race, gender, and class. Jesus never once pushed back on that. All he told this woman, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, he would give you water, living water. And when that woman heard about that living water, first thing came to her mind was herself, I don't blame her, give me some of that water. And you know why she wanted it? So she wouldn't have to come back down to that well in shame because of the other sinner women who thought they were less sinful than she was. Listen to that foolishness. Yeah. All of them are sinners, but now she's more of a sinner. Why? She's had five husbands. And the one she's with is not hers. Well, let's bring it on home. Some of you got five gods. And the God you with ain't even your God. No, no, don't, don't get the script. This stuff is designed to pierce the soul. Because I guarantee you, the only person I have to prove myself to is the Almighty. And even then, I'm begging for his mercy. Maybe you're here this morning, and you are evaluating your worship to God. Then I've made, I've made some progress. Because if you're not thinking about your own worship, then you've missed this message. We've got to get to know God, be known of God, and then to acknowledge him. Isaiah 45 and verse 5, I am God, and beside me there is no other. Say amen. Well, if you're here this morning, you need to respond. We ask that you would do so. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need further insight about the topic at hand. I'll be more than glad to help you. We've got people here who have knowledge about God's word, male and female, sisters and brothers in Christ who will be willing to help you. Maybe it's time for you to head home. Maybe you're looking forward to coming back to worship. And now, because of my message, you're thinking more seriously about not coming. I'd rather have you not come and thinking about coming than to come and not be here worshiping in spirit and in truth. We've got to be clear about that. Everybody want to get back to get back to normal. I don't want to do the old me anymore. I want to do the new. Watch this now. The new version of God for me. We're leaving too much to chance. If you're here this morning, you want to come home. Maybe you're not a child of God. Maybe you're not in the household of God. You can come by faith, repentance, and baptism. Acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Give up on this world system. That's repentance. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Acts 2, 38. Acts 17, 30. Repent, turn away from, and then come on home to God. What's in the house of God? Mercy! You may not get it from the members, but you're sure enough get it from the mercy seat. And he'll accept you wherever you are. Wherever you've been is irrelevant to God. Just come on home. There's room in the house of God for you. 
We'll pray with you. If you're struggling, we'll struggle with you. You can struggle with us. Everybody in the house is struggling with something. Say amen. 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 Not all the struggles are out there. They're in here. You know, but we got a God who's merciful, who's gracious. He's got a gracious and a merciful church. We'll love you. We'll stand beside you. We'll cry when you cry, and when you celebrate, we'll celebrate with you. And when you get extra change, we'll help you spend it. Praise God. One big happy family. But you got to come. If you need prayer and you're struggling, let us know. We'll pray for you. We got some praying people in this congregation. We've been praying ever since we were in the pandemic and before. We got God is we have prayed ourselves through. That's why we're here. You think no one's thinking here because you've been so good, you've been taking your vitamins. You, you don't even know what you've been taking. You just come, come on, okay. And then you scared of the shot. Well, you didn't have most stuff that you don't know what you've taken. All of us, this little old shot gonna scare you. And half of the stuff you've been taking gonna take you out. But we got a God. They can raise you from the dead. That's good news, church. Now, don't, they don't go out there and be crazy now, Joe, and eat up and drink up. I mean, eat up everything out there and, and carry on all kind of way. You know, we got to take care of each other. I'm my brother's keeper. You got to watch me and I got to watch you. And listen, Doc, I love you. I'm waiting on it, man. Come on, don't let me down. I can't hear you. I love you too. We, I can, we, can't nobody hear that, man. All right. Now, see, look. I love you too, boy. I love each one of you. And God loves us all. If you're here, you need to respond. I want you to know that God loves you. Let's together stand and sing. Won't you come? Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, now why don't you Somebody's knocking at your door Well, he knocks like Jesus Somebody's knocking at your door I said he knocks like Jesus Somebody's knocking at your door Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody, somebody, somebody is knocking at your door. Well, somebody's knocking at your door. Sinner, now why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Let the church say amen. You may be seated. We have a few prayer requests at this time. I do want to read these, uh, and then we'll go to our Father in prayer. Mary Crawford is asking for traveling prayers for her daughters and granddaughter next week uh, from California to three other states, and so we'll include her in our prayer. Phyllis Washington states, um, good morning, church. Thank you for your many prayers. My granddaughter is nine months young and has chronic lung disease. Please pray <clears throat> for True Lee. Thank you all, and uh, God bless you. And, of course, there will be others coming in. We do want to keep in mind the Taiska family as we uh, utilize her this, uh, this week and to pray to Lee. Lee's been faithful during this pandemic. He's been strong. And, man, I've been watching your faith, and I admire you for that. I know to lose mama is a tough one. And then, of course, we want to pray for the Moran family. They lost their mother as well. Let's pray at this time. God of heaven, what an honor and a privilege it is to call you our father. But greater still the reality that you would look down from lofty heights and consider us to be your children. We are humbled at that reality. Even now, as we call on your name, kind father, we're mindful of these prayer requests. Mary Crawford is asking for traveling grace for her daughters and granddaughters from state to state. Father, keep them safe. Cover them with your grace. Grant them safe pass passage, and if it's your will, bring them back home. And Father, we lift up Sister Phyllis Washington. Uh, she is asking for prayers for uh, her nine 
a month old granddaughter who has chronic lung disease. Father, it touches our heart when a child is ill. So we're praying for truly, Father, that all of the medical doctors and nurses uh, will be at her disposal to help her deal with this lung disease. We're praying for healing. Cover her and keep her, encourage her a little heart and be with her parents uh, and loved ones as well. And then, Father, we're mindful of the Taiska family. We continue to ask prayer for them. We're thankful for Lee and his heart, his strength and his courage. We ask, Father, that the services will go according to plan, that you'll be glorified and the family will be comforted and edified, knowing that their mother served you faithfully the duration of her life. Father, we lift up also the Moran family at the loss of their loved one. We're praying for comfort and consolation. She is another longtime attendee here at the Figaro Congregation. We're grateful for these saints, Father, who have served you throughout the duration of their lives and have lived long lives to your name, honor, and glory. Now, Father, there may be others who are concerned about other people and who have needs for themselves. You're a God who sees all and knows all. Visit them and visit all of us in our times of challenge, even in the midst of this pandemic. We pray your presence continually. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To remember the death barrel, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. This is now the time that we take out to give back a proportion of our income that the Lord so richly blessed us over the week. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Apostle Paul writing, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, here we find how one should give when being blessed by God, enabling him to give. But this I say, he who soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. And let us all continue to support the work of the church. And remember what the Lord said in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. At this time, let us offer thanks for the offering. Eternal God, our Father who art in heaven, it is to thee, Father, we come with our heads bowed. Thank you for this privilege of allowing us to give back a proportion of our income, Father, that you so richly bless us over the week. We just pray and ask, Father, for those who have desire to give, but not have the funds. We just pray and ask, Father, you help them to be able to give at the next appointed time. And we also pray, Father, for those who are dispersing these funds. We just ask, Father, you allow them to be carried out in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. This we do pray and thank thee, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher, I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Well, I see those hilltops of glory I now can see. And over the won't you come go with me? Say, for the mountain I soon shall stand on those hilltops of glory land. Well, I see those hilltops of glory I now can see. Oh, brother, won't you come go with me? I'm safe for the mountain I soon shall stand on those hilltops of glory land. Let's prepare our minds for communion. 
last and did my say you believe and did my suffering die would he devote that sacred hand for such a word as I at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. <clears throat> Let us always be mindful of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Luke writing, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow and continue to speech until midnight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29, Apostle Paul writing, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drink of damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. At this time, let us offer thanks for the bread and the cup. Eternal God, our Father who art in heaven, it is to thee again, Father, we come with our heads bowed. Thank you for this privilege of allowing us to gather around your son's table and to be partakers of this bread, Father, which represents your son's precious body and this cup which represents your son's precious blood. We just ask, Father, allow our minds to go back to the cross and remember your son, Jesus Christ, how he came, lived, and died, and shed his blood for all mankind. This we do pray and thank thee, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. At this time, let us take of the bread and the cup. At the cross where I first saw the light And the burdens of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the for those of you who have been watching the live stream, I'd like to apologize for the sound. After this service, we will post a video on YouTube and on Facebook of a clear version of the sermon for your viewing and listening pleasure. And now for our announcements. I'll start with the announcement that is not in the bulletin. You will not see this in the bulletin yet. But this is an announcement from the Figueroa Youth Ministry, and they are pleased to announce the launch of Generation Connect. This is a virtual program that will last for six weeks, and it will connect the youth with seniors. And the youth will be helping the seniors uh, get for, more familiar with the phones, the smartphones, the tablets, computers, social media, and online games. Students will also receive community service credits from their high schools by just simply checking in. And we're just connecting the community. And so there's also professional development training that goes along with this. So if you would like to be a part of this, there will be a survey. 
and it says, teens and seniors, please go to Generation Connect website and take the survey. The uh, survey can be found on generationconnect.io. I believe that's correct. And seniors, if you have any questions, but just, just if you have any questions or if that information is not correct, please reach out to Brother Gobble or reach out to Sister Danita uh, Frazon. And Brother Gobble's number is 323 620 Five two zero two, and Sister Danita's number is two one three seven one three one one zero seven. And now for the announcements that are in the bulletin, please continue to keep uh, our brother Leander Taiska in your prayers, and remember that the service will be on April 29th at one p.m., and that's at the um, at Harrison and Ross. 4601 South Crenshaw Boulevard, Los Angeles. Once again, that's April 29th, 1 p.m. And keep the family in prayer. Employment opportunities. 1,000 people need it immediately to sanitize LAUSD. The days are Monday through Friday and benefits are immediate. As soon as you are uh, past the background check, you receive your benefits. And... Um, Contact 323-204-2225 or email Sammy Yarp, that's S-A-M-M-I-E-Y-A-R-P at gmail.com. Once again, that's S-A-M-M-I-E-Y-A-R-P at gmail.com. Also, keep in mind, another opportunity for Figaro Christian Daycare Academy, several positions, assistant director, teacher, teacher assistant, and cook. Please reach out to Sister Ida Shaw for more information. Her number is 323-947-6317. And now for our class information, we still have classes, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Wednesday, the, and we also have uh, classes on Sundays. So we have classes for everyone. And remember, Sunday starts at 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. for a sweet hour of prayer. And the normal Bible study class begins at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. So please continue to check FigueroaCLC.com uh, Figueroa for more information. If you have a prayer request, continue to submit those by calling 323-753-2523. Three, six. Contributions can still be picked up from 11 to 2 p.m. on Saturdays and 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Sundays. Keep in mind, we're still trying to open up, so please be with the, uh, the, the, the health team as they strive to make sure that everything is correct. If you received anything in the mail from the Church of Christ, please sign and return it so we can uh, know exactly what we're dealing with on the day of opening. And I'll turn you back over to our minister, Brother Hawkins. Maud and um, all of the information that he has shared can be viewed on our website at figueroaclc.com. I want to thank once again uh, the virtual community that listens to our messages and participates in our worship services. We're always grateful to have you uh, each week. If you have any questions or concerns, you can hit us back at our website and we'll do our best to get back with you. Do want to make a few closing announcements. I want to thank our worship team always and the new addition. The new addition. That sounds like a ring, doesn't it? Orlando Murray, thank you for coming out, uh, for being with us this morning. Appreciate you very much. And also, Derek, it's good to have you. And then the reopening team. Uh, I do want to give them a shout out. Uh, for the past six to eight months, we've been working. And uh, I just want to thank God for them. God placed it upon my heart to put a team together because he knew and I knew that he knew that I knew that he knew that I could not do this by myself. They are the energy, they are the minds, they are the shakers and movers and we are grateful uh, to all of them for your work. So I want you to know that personally and I'm going to request that the church send each of you somewhere after this is over. Don't ask me where but we'll send you somewhere wherever we go as a group. But we have a meeting and we're right on time. 
I do want to give a, a few announcements regarding the reopening. As you well know, we've been prompting you uh, through uh, email and uh, text and a letter sent out. And we are just grateful for our church family. We have over 100 plus letters that have returned. And the data I've gathered from Sister Vernell Robinson is that uh, a large majority, about 75 to 80 plus, are uh, excited about coming back. But more than that, they're excited about complying with the rules and regulations. Uh, and while I'm up here, masks will be mandatory at all times with the exception of taking your communion. Okay, so we want you to participate. And then social distancing must be practiced. And so that means there will be no meandering around the facility. It won't be fellowship hour. Uh, the restrooms will be open. Everything will be sanitized this coming Friday by uh, a uh, professional company. And we're excited about that. And we'll follow each week. That is vitally important. One of the things the reopening team wanted to do is to make sure that we reopen safely and securely. And we appreciate every component of that. The objective would be to worship, so let's not get lost on your uh, personal idiosyncrasies about you know, what you do here. It, it won't be about that. We're planning to go in zones. The information I'm sharing with you uh, is in the bulletin. And Brother Whitaker's zone uh, will be the first zone to come in on the second. And we are preparing for a capacity of 50 people. There will be some, uh, of course, some uh, some working with those situations where individuals have gotten some misinformation. We won't turn anyone, else, anyone away, but we're asking you to comply to coming with your zone. We're going to do this each week after May 2nd, May 9th, Oscar Ward Zone, May 16th, Reuben Barkin Zone, May 23rd, Cecil Godbold Zone. And these are the zones that have been designated right out of the zone ministry. And so we appreciate Vernell uh, coordinating much of this for us, and the response that we've gotten has been positive. And then, Lord willing, on the 30th, as we assess week to week how we are mitigating these weekly services, we may very well have all zones and members on the 30th. Don't hold us to that. Everything is dependent upon how you come back. So if you come back in the spirit of the Lord, amen. If you come back in the spirit of praise and cooperation and communication, maybe with God's favor we can all bump those numbers up and, and, and move back to some level of, of congregating again as a church. I do want to encourage you to arrive early. Check in at the medical team table at 9 a.m. I will be in the auditorium facilitating Bible class. A very good question came up in Bible class as we were processing reopening. And that is we're going to be working on a simulcast, uh, more so live streaming Bible study. So whether you're at home or here, you can take advantage of it, or on your phone as well. And so whatever we do, we're going to have it available for you. So check in at 9 a.m. Uh, wear your mask. If you don't have one, we'll... We have a uh, mask for you to purchase. They are expensive now. They will cost you $100 per mask. And if you want to double up, that's two. That's two C notes. No checks, no visa cards, and no fake money. But we will have masks for you. We will have sanitizers. Uh, we got a great team. It's going to be great. So we're excited. We just need you to cooperate, continue to pray for us. Listen, we love you, and we thank God for you. And we're looking forward to next week. God bless you and have a grand day. And also, in, inside here, put your mask on. Joe, I love you. Uh, six feet away from me. And wash your hands. <laughs> don't, don't be running up to me wanting a hug. Because it's not going to happen. Fist pump from a distance. God bless you, boy. Mm -hmm. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a leaning on. Jesus, I'm leaning on.
I'm saved. You know that I'm saved and secure from all of to dread what have I to fear leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near I lean leaning on the everlasting Oh, you know that I'm leaning on Jesus, I'm leaning on Jesus, well, I'm safe and secure from all along. Oh, I'm leaning on Jesus, I'm leaning on Jesus. Let us pray. Shall we pray? Our Father God in heaven, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come here and worship you today in spirit and in truth. Father, be with us throughout this day and throughout our lives. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. But this is our prayer in your son, Jesus Christ, only in righteous name. Amen. to his house to magnify the Lord and worship him worship we have come into his house to magnify the Lord good morning church family the day has finally come when the Figaro Church of Christ will reopen for morning worship. We will contact members soon to gauge their desire for worship attendance that will begin May 2nd. The reopening team has worked behind the scenes to prepare for this day. Moving forward, this video can be seen at VigoroyCoc.com. Concentrate on you and worship.